But uh, anyway, it's it's great to be here tonight. Thanks so much for having me as part of your program. Uh, the, the tonight's program is really an, a nature show in a sense. It's it's not specifically on birds, but birds will be a solid theme throughout. I actually never lead bird watching trips. I lead nature trips. Uh, and that way, you know, if it's a beetle that's taking apart some dung or or a, a lion taking down a zebra, it all fits into the whole the whole kettle of fish. So and tonight's program is going to be sort of like that, I think. And and the reason why I wanted to concentrate on the COVID years is because it was it was the time when I was unemployed. <laughs> and being unemployed was actually kind of a treat uh, because it gave me a chance to get to know Western Canada. So we did uh, about six or seven years ago, my wife and I bought a camper and we thought, oh, this will come in really handy for when we're really old. Well, let me tell you, it came in real handy during COVID. We used it uh, uh, a lot and we explored places in Saskatchewan and of course here in Alberta and in BC. And one of our objectives was to go back to places that we hadn't been to for a long time or visit new places. And I guess it just sort of relit the fire for the joy of getting out and exploring what we've got in our own backyard. You know, I've, I've always looked upon you guys in BC with a bit of envy. I've got BC envy uh, because, you know, there's you, you guys have so much in the way of diversity in the, with the ocean uh, up to the shoreline, the mountains uh, and a variety of habitats in between. But one of the things that COVID reintroduced to me was the value of what the prairies offer. So, so we're gonna we're gonna do that uh, tonight. And I, I want to start off though. Uh, let me just share my screen here. We'll just start off with uh, with a a little video that I want to show you. Uh, that uh, let's just get this thing up and running. There we go. Uh, so we're going to go to a number of different places tonight. And, and I think a good way to start it off is with a, a two and a half minute video that will put together, in a sense, uh, where my philosophy stands. So enjoy this. I've searched this entire park for the best nature experiences. Since I was a little kid, I've had an interest in the outdoors. It's just drawn me for some reason. We're involved in too much on a day-to-day -day basis. Nature slows you down, forces you to think, forces you to look. Come with me. This is gonna blow your mind. It's a, an opportunity to rediscover what makes us human. This place. Oh, let's go. Come on. As the call of injury permeates your whole body and makes you vibrate. It puts us in touch with the earth and the air and the water and and things that are green. We hear a lot about the negative aspects of the planet. We hear a lot about how nature is coming to an end. But the world I see is still a green world. If you look still vast tracts of uncut forest that has never heard the sound of a chainsaw. There are still oceanic regimes that are as abundant as they ever were. Those places still exist. The nature is out there, and if we let it get within us, it can change our attitude and change our perspective, I think, on life and even how we view ourselves. This quest is all about discovery, to show the diversity it still exists on this green planet of ours. Observe some of nature's most profound moments. Nature is powerful. Nature can be very cruel. We're about to experience nature at its best. Want to come along for the ride? Yeah, there we go. <laughs> so let's go for a ride. We're going to start off in Kenya because uh, even during COVID, when COVID, just when, when Delta was disappearing and before Omicron started to rear its ugly head, we managed to pull off a trip to East Africa. And for a lot of these camps that we were at, we were the first tourists they had seen since COVID had started. So it was very exciting. We went to Amboseli first of all, which is in the shadow of Kilimanjaro on the Kenyan side. And we were 
absolutely amazed because the rains that had fallen a couple of years earlier had flooded the landscape uh, with incredible water abundance. And the last time I was in this park, probably three decades earlier, it was as dry as popcorn. So what a pleasure it was. It took us over two hours to get from the dirt airstrip to our camp, which should have been about a 20 minute drive. We saw something like 40 species of birds in that two hour period with our first introduction being about, oh, maybe 100,000 flamingos. And they had just flown in from uh, from Lake uh, Natron in Tanzania just within the previous couple of weeks. So what an incredible introduction to Africa! And and uh, we were because we were. Uh, in a private concession right next to Ambicelli National Park, when I saw this photograph lining up, I asked my guide if I could get out of the vehicle and slip underneath the vehicle and shoot from bumper level. And that's what allowed me to get this photograph of these elephants walking in with Kilimanjaro in the background. What a pleasure. And from there, we went up to a private reserve called Lewa, which is famous because it was uh, it used to be a cattle ranch. Uh, that was basically losing money, employed about 40 people or so. And then they got the bright idea in the 1990s when rhinos were disappearing all over Africa to turn it into a rhino intensive protection zone. And now they're in the business of breeding rhinos. This is Sonia with her eighth calf. That's her two-year-old calf right now. She has one of the longest horns of any rhino that I've ever seen. But the, the ranch itself has about 400 rhinos and they've been exporting rhinos to other areas that have been depleted in rhino population to help them bolster their numbers. So it's quite a success story. And it's a, it's, it's a reserve that's big enough that it has the entire uh, uh, ecological component. All of the predators are there and a variety of ungulates and so on. There's even hyenas and yes, hyenas eat meat too. This was actually one of the cleanest kill shots that I could show. I had to show something of a bit of drama tonight, uh, but this was really quite something. The zebra, we got to the zebra just at the same time the hyena got to it and the zebra was already dead. I guess zebra die of old age too or something. And the hyena immediately tucked into it. A few minutes later, this picture was a lot different, but uh, right now it shows some of the drama that can be seen out on that landscape. And from there, we went into Rwanda, which I've, I've been traveling to Rwanda since the 1980s, the mid 1980s, when the guerrilla project, the tourism project just started. And what a pleasure it was. After in, an incredible COVID protocol, we were there up in the mountains with the gorillas. And my wife is on the right hand side of your screen. She just handed off her phone to our guide when he saw that it looked like there was going to be an opportunity to get a picture of my group with the gorillas in the background. Just when he took the picture, that little photo bomber right behind me, I'm the guy, the second uh, from the, the left uh, with the hat, uh, the weird hat. Uh, right when that photograph was taken, that little gorilla was grinding his finger into my back, basically uh, taking advantage of an opportunity where I was uh, not able to back away. But very exciting to be back in that part of the world, especially when they had had so much difficulty during COVID. Uh, and like I said, the, the protocols were really quite exceptional. Later that year, actually, the, the following January, we were uh, out into Ecuador. We went into the Amazon rainforest. The bird watching was spectacular, especially when you can get up into these high elevation platforms like this above the canopy. That's where one sees species of toucans and various species of parrots. The bird life was really quite overwhelming. Difficult birding, some of the hardest birding you'll ever do. But when you have an opportunity like this with a good scope and a good guide, it's really quite exceptional. And it was one of the few trips that I've done to the tropics where I actually had an opportunity to see a sloth doing something. <laughs> They're usually just sitting there. I remember the first time I came across a sloth, I lay down on my on my back with holding my binoculars up to my head so I didn't have to crane my neck. And it took a half an hour to watch the sloth make a decision. So they're very slow moving animals, but what a pleasure to see this guy traversing from one branch to another. Of course, monkeys are the opposite extreme. They've had way too much coffee. This is a little uh, a squirrel monkey, and we saw hundreds of them uh, during our stay in, in, the, in the Amazon at that time. Uh, and of course, nighttime walks reveal all kinds of amazing things, various species of insects, of course, but also lots of frogs like this one.
And then out to the Galapagos, and I'm sure many of you have traveled to the Galapagos. It is a bird watching paradise. If you're into boobies, especially, this is the red footed booby. I think they're one of the most handsome of all of the boobies. Incredible birds and in good numbers out there, along with so many other species that you're all familiar with. But I have always said that the Galapagos is 50% aquatic. So 50% of the uh, of the um, of, of the whole experience is getting in the water. And on this particular trip, we had one experience that absolutely blew us away. From a distance, we saw a whole bunch of dolphins. We started zooming out in our zodiac. The dolphins then came to us because they enjoy riding bow waves. And then we slowed down. Then we had the opportunity to go back to the ship, get into our dive outfits, and then get back. And sure enough, we had this experience waiting for us. So we have a catamaran here and we're heading off from the catamaran. Of course, like I said, 50% of the experience in the Galapagos is aquatic. The, wa the uh, uh, wildlife under the water is incredible, but this was a truly unique experience. I've been to the Galapagos many times, but to have this opportunity with what they call a super pod of dolphins was something surreal. The numbers of dolphins, uh, probably around 150. Uh, they usually travel around in groups of five, six, or seven, but to see a group this big, and obviously there's a strategy here, there's some feeding benefit or social benefit that they get by teaming up in groups like this. The way we did it, we went out with the Zodiacs, our dive master told us to get into the water, and then the Zodiacs took off, and then they would do big long circles around us, bringing the dolphins back to us each time, because the dolphins had no interest in us floating in the water like globs of protoplasm. The dolphins wanted to swim with the Zodiacs. Every time I saw the dolphins though coming towards us with the Zodiac, I would dive down, I was wearing a weight belt so I could sit down at about 10 meters and wait for the dolphins. After a while, after maybe the fifth, sixth or seventh time around us, some of the dolphins started to get curious about this human that was floating in the water. And they came over to me on several occasions. We could hear them squeaking and, and you could feel on your body the echolocation as their communications would hit us. An absolutely surreal experience and a real privilege to, uh, to be uh, in the water with creatures that are that intelligent. Okay, well, let's get back to the, the to COVID now. So that was an, an inter-COVID experience. That was when, like I said, Delta disappeared before Omicron reappeared, and we managed to pull off a couple of trips. But now, two and a half years, basically, of no international travel and not much travel other than local stuff. This is a self-portrait uh, in Kananaskis on a very chilly day, skiing in the backcountry. Uh, but uh, I'm going to start off our trip down in the Antarctic, which actually is where I'm going to be heading to next week. But the, the Antarctic was, was where we were when the world started to change. When we left on our ship to head towards the Antarctic, we, know, we knew that there was this thing called COVID starting to manifest around the world. But I have to say, uh, every single penguin I met, none of them had heard of COVID. And we felt so far away from the real world. We were in our own little bubble. Uh, these are Gen 2 penguins here. That was a chin strap penguin that you saw in the preceding picture. But I guess what I really enjoy about being down there is the action and activity that these birds offer. This is a group of Gen 2s, and this is just like all of you guys coming to the Nature Vancouver meeting tonight. You're all super excited. Look at this, look at this energy. Everybody's coming and going, but there's always one that just about overdoes it, and there it goes down into the slot down below. And I suppose that's, uh, uh, what it's like when we're all excited about what life has to offer. The, the Antarctic, anyway, is a profound place. Uh, it, it is so big. I always say it's a landscape of big numbers of penguins, big numbers of albatross and other tube-nosed oceanic birds, big glaciers, big waves, big numbers of whales. It really is an overwhelming wilderness location. Uh, and then from that Antarctic, though, we headed up to Chile. We said goodbye to the group, and my wife and I then headed off for our own week's holiday in the Atacama Desert, which is about 3,000 meters above sea level and rises much higher than that. Uh, but it's known for its clear skies uh, and incredible celestial events. Uh, we 
got really got into exploring the landscape and birding. We saw about 33 species of birds during the time that we were in the Atacama Desert, two species of, of uh, flamingos and Andean uh, geese and a, a variety of others. But the landscape absolutely blew us away. Remember, this is what they call a hyper arid location. It's basically all, any moisture that has been trying to get over the Andes are sucked dry. The uh, amount of rainfall here, uh, well, you can go decades without Without any rain at all. And yet it's incredible how life persists. These are some Juanacos that we found in one of the valleys, uh, and they're eating uh, plants like, like cactus. There is occasional rainstorms. This is not my photograph. This was taken last year or actually, I guess, the year before now uh, after a, a major rainstorm. And it was one of the occurrences that convinced the Chilean government to put this area under protective status. So uh, and I believe it's been made into a national park since. But uh, that kind of wildflower abundance occurred after those incredible rains, uh, which only occur, like I said, said, maybe once every 10 years, maybe once every 100 years. And, and as a result, there are some incredibly amazing salt lakes there, including the one where we came across this little puna plover. This was a, a new species for my wife and I, a tiny little plover. And the unique part about watching this plover was where we watched it from. The lake itself is about 30% salt. Uh, and so you float like a piece of styrofoam. It's the weirdest thing if you've never been in a densely salt lake like this it's very odd you have trouble actually moving your feet down below you uh, underneath but it gave us a chance to watch the puna plover and uh, to float around under that incredibly beautiful clear uh, sky of the Atacama Desert and then uh, well I feel like Mary Poppins here I'm saying I've, I'm floating with my umbrella and the umbrella is pulling me across to the other side and that that was this picture was taken 24 hours before we left Chile. Uh, we went back to Santiago that night, started our long flight home back to Calgary. And when we got home, just three days later, the world closed down. So what a contrast between the the the, the high elevation of of the uh, of the desert and then coming to our own Canadian landscape. Uh, I celebrated my 65th birthday soon after that. Friends came over. Remember these days when we were scared to get close to each other? She's handing me off my birthday card and I'm sweeping it off a broom onto a snow shovel. How more Canadian COVID could you get than that? But uh, remember those days. It doesn't, it was actually, it doesn't seem like that long ago, but uh, my gosh, things have changed since. And and it, it, being unemployed gave me some time to go and do some cutting of firewood. I heat my house with wood here in Calgary. It allowed us to then put our camper on and do some winter camping, which was, was something we hadn't done in our camper before. This is out in the Kananaskis and exploring some of these parks, you know, in, in their uncrowded best, which was, I, th I call it a COVID treat. Uh, and we started to get back into thin cross-country skiing. We've been ski mountaineering for the last several decades, but getting into the back country was not considered to be the right thing to do during COVID because if you got injured, they'd have to send in a helicopter and so on and so forth. It would put the rescue operations at risk. So we started cross-country skiing and we've continued on this uh, trend ever since. Lightweight skiing just reopened and reinvigorated the whole concept of getting back out there. We did a little bit of back country skiing in the Kananaskis. But I think the thing that I really enjoyed was the fact that it we had day after day or week after week of getting out there and exploring some of the areas that we had never skied to or hiked into before. We actually skied up to this location, but had to take our skis off and kick step the last little bit. This is a place called Karst Springs. I've seen it on the map, on the Kananaskis maps since my high school years, but I've never bothered going there to explore. But it's a spring that emanates water all winter long. And as we were there, a dipper came in and we were able to watch it for a while. We sat down and started to have our lunch as we sat in the snow. And then a second dipper came in and they did a duet call. It's the first time I've ever seen dippers call in duet. It was absolutely magic. And uh, again, a COVID gift. We also started to spend a lot more time 
following tracks, putting skins on our skis, going into the woods and following tracks. This is a pine marten. And you don't see pine martens very often. But a friend of mine, a fellow by the name of David Gray, who used to be the former CBC radio morning host here in Calgary, he got this incredible photograph when he was out cross-country skiing in the Columbian Mountains. And, uh, and it made me very jealous. But the following summer, as I was having a cup of tea in the morning, this little Martin came out, not quite as good as David Gray's picture, but still, at least it's a very energetic, beautiful photograph of a pine Martin. So these are the little gifts that we had. Skiing in Kananaskis, we came across a hole in the snow and we followed the tracks into the forest. They were otter tracks. I had never seen otter before in the Kananaska since we were right up against the Banff National Park border. I phoned later when I got home, I phoned the chief park ecologist of Banff and asked him if they had any otter sightings in Banff National Park. It's rare, apparently it's rare when they see one, but he did point me in the direction of where this otter where its ancestry might have come from. A fellow by the name of Martin Yelkowski, who's famous for his cougar long-term 10-year cougar study in the front ranges here in the Rocky Mountains, he actually, for his master's thesis, uh, uh, reintroduced otters back into the Kananaskis. When beaver trapping was big in Western Canada, otters got trapped out by default and they're slower to reproduce. So they've only slowly been coming back. But in 1981, Martin went back to his old master's thesis and photographed these and sent them to me so I could use them in this show. Uh, but he was the one that introduced them back into the Kananaskis where they had been in previous decades, but had been extirpated for so long. And, uh, and we saw evidence that they're, they're back in the park. We also came across wolf tracks. Uh, we tried to get to our cross-country ski trails early in the morning before anybody else got there. So we'd leave Calgary very early and start skiing at sunrise. And it had just finished snowing when we had started skiing and these tracks were fresh. So the wolves had just been there. A week later, we were skiing at the north end or we were setting up to go skiing at the north end of Lake Minnewanka in Banff. And out on the lake, we saw what looked like pepper flakes. It was a pack of wolves, the famous Bow Valley pack. So I'm using my wife's head here as a stable platform to put my binoculars on to use her phone to photograph the wolves. My wife is much more stable than I am. So she made the perfect tripod for me to photograph this. So you can see the pepper flakes in the middle of the of the image there. And there's the wolves. And so I, I noticed that the trailing wolf had a broken leg, or at least it had its leg sticking straight out back. So I got back onto the phone to the chief park ecologist of Banff National Park. And I said, we got an injured wolf here. He said, Brian, don't worry about it. That wolf has been injured since September and the other wolves are looking after it. And sure enough, as we watched these wolves, they would traverse across the snow, across the ice, and they would wait every now and again for the limping wolf to catch up to them. So, and, and this was, that was exceptionally exciting. And, and the, that Banff Park ecologist sent me a photograph of the pack uh, that was taken the year earlier, uh, taking apart uh, an elk that had been hit by a car on the highway, and they used a skidoo to drag it in away from the road so that the wolves wouldn't, uh, uh, by chance, walk onto the highway. But, uh, and then of course, during COVID, the park closed down the 1A highway, which is the, the, the highway right beside the main highway that takes you all the way to Johnson's Canyon, which is one of the most popular tourist sites in the park. And so they closed it to, to, to car traffic, but opened it only to bicycle traffic. And this was probably, it's probably one of the prettiest bicycle uh, trips in all of the Rockies. And without cars, it made it absolutely brilliant for bird watching, but also for animal watching. Because those of you who have driven this road will know exactly where that tree is. But look to where the right of the tree is. There's a wolf. That is the wolf with the gimped back leg. And so right away, I got back on to my good buddy now, the park chief park ecologist for Banff. And I said, I found your wolf with the busted leg. And he said, Brian, you not only found the wolf, but the den is about 100 meters up in the forest. She's the appointed caretaker or babysitter of the pups. And so that was an exciting COVID discovery. Well, now let me tell you from a birding perspective, Johnson's Canyon, the last time I visited here was in my high school years because it's so busy so busy, about five, six, seven, eight, ten thousand 10,000 people a day walk the trails uh, during the height of the season. So I've ignored it, except in the middle of winter when I've walked up when it's been frozen. But uh, on this particular uh, day, 
we came across the black swift. And the black swift, there's only three pair that are nesting there. They found another small population of black swifts uh, nesting in another part of the national park. But I photographed the heck out of this swift uh, from the boardwalk across from it. And then I phoned up the Banff uh, chief park ecologist, now my very good friend, we're on a first name basis. And I said, I found the black swift. And he said, yeah, Brian, if you tell anybody where it is, I'll have to kill you. So, but seriously, I said, the photograph that I got of the Swift is great, but I noticed there's a little plastic disc. It looks like the bottom of the old Kodak film canisters or one of the tops of those old plastic canisters. I said, what is that thing in the nest? And the chief park ecologist told me they're doing a major study on the black swift because these are such unusual birds with such unusual feeding behaviors and, and a huge migration down to the Amazon rainforest every year. That little device is recording the air temperature and the humidity in the nest. And at the end of the season, when the chicks have left the nest, they'll go and retrieve that device and upload the data to learn more about these unique creatures. These are the birds of the, of the, uh, with, uh, that live in the aerial column. They fly very high, they leave the nest before sunrise in the morning, come down after sunrise at the end of the day as an anti-predator strategy, and they feed uh, up to three, 4,000 meters above the ground, uh, high up there uh, 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 on arboreal insects. Incredible birds. Well, let's get back to some of the more common birds. Back here in Calgary, a lot of bald eagles during the COVID time. I'm not sure why. It was just uh, very good numbers. Uh, I think we counted about 30 on one weekend. Uh, and I know you guys on the coast, you've got them uh, all over the place. But for us, it's quite unique. This is an immature bald eagle, and they're feeding uh, on uh, things like uh, the the, the geese and the ducks on the river, as are the coyotes. And this is shot right off my back porch um, on my back of the yard. I live right beside the Bow River. We had coyotes walking up and down on the frozen ice on the frozen river all winter long and sometimes in perfect light. And, uh, and of course, where there's dogs like coyotes, there's going to be cats. Well, we've had some exceptional years of bobcats. I was sitting on, uh, on the toilet doing my morning constitution here at my house with the window open and there was magpies going crazy just outside my window. And I was looking and looking with my, with my eyes and with my binoculars to try to find, I was sure an owl was somewhere out there. And uh, my wife came in and right away she figured out that the magpies were uptight at the bobcats. We ended up finding mom and three kittens. And here's how that story unfolded. So filming from up through from the bathroom, that's the view that we had. And then I snuck outside and using a big solid fence between me and my neighbors, I was able to film over top using the fence as a blind. And that's mom on the right doing what cats do and giving the little one a poof on the head uh, and I put it in slow motion. The mother, the mother bobcat uh, disciplines her youngster, but a fabulous interplay of behavior of mom and cub. And as I was filming these two, my wife was behind me. She saw another uh, three baby bobcats. So four, four baby bobcats in total plus mom, or three baby bobcats in total plus mom. So four cats in total. Absolutely amazing. Uh, and cats being cats, they like their feet clean and they don't like their feet getting dirty. Ah, I gotta shake that. And, uh, and then this is one of the youngsters you can see. It's got that juvenile look in the face. Mom would have been just about to play tough love here. Uh, she was just about to kick them uh, out and for them to find their own territory. But there they are with a wiggle of their little short tail heading off to go and hunt something out in the, along the Bow River of Calgary. So what an amazing experience. Well, and uh, every morning for about six weeks during COVID in a spruce tree right beside that same bathroom where I spotted the, the, uh, the magpies going crazy, we had an owl roosting. And every morning I would go and do my thing on the toilet and look into the eyes of wisdom. And if it, when you have a day that starts off like that, you know you're going to have a good day. And we had Turk the turkey. Some of you uh, who have Calgary connections may have heard about this turkey. It escaped from something going on down at the Stampede the summer before, and it survived for a surprisingly lengthy time, uh, including coming right over to my house a couple of times. He was the Ramsey turkey, so he was in the next in the neighborhood next door, but we like to think of him as ours. He was eventually taken out by a coyote, which I think is a distinguished way to go when you're a city turkey. Beats the heck out of being hit by a car. And all of this time being unemployed, I had the chance of going and chasing some of the rare bird alerts that we heard about a great-tailed grackle on 
on the east side of the city. My wife and I drove out there within 45 minutes. We found it and managed to photograph it. And of course, as you know, this is way off its normal range. They're found much further to the south. Uh, down in South Calgary, I got a call about a Lewis's woodpecker that uh, was over from the Columbia Valley, I guess. He made a, a right instead of making a left, ended up here in Calgary and spent most of the summer there. So we went down and found that. And then when we were driving in southern BC, after visiting my dad in Kelowna, we were coming back, we were coming through the, the, uh, the Rocky Mountain Trench. Dee's sister, Kirsten, and Kirsten, I think you're watching this right now. Uh, she texted us and said, you've got an indigo bunting near you. And sure enough, she dropped a pin on the map. We drove to that location. Within 15 minutes, we heard the bunting calling. And then we spent about a half an hour with it taking photographs. And uh, an amazing bird to see in, in British Columbia, way off of its normal southern range. Uh, so, and then we did some other Saskatchewan trips too. So we headed east and to enjoy those morning Saskatchewan sunrises and sunsets, the, can the snow geese were in their numbers, in huge numbers. And we just were absolutely overjoyed to go at the right time of the year to catch these large numbers as they were migrating through. And I know you get them, uh, Colin, I was with you on the uh, uh, Vancouver Island when we saw a number of snow geese coming your through your neck of the woods. So we get the same kind of numbers here. Then we hired a guide, a fellow by the name of Stan Shattuck up in Saskatoon. And we, we, he took us out for looking for whooping cranes for a day north of Saskatoon. Stan is quite a well-known birder. He used to be the president of their Natural History Society. Uh, and, and he has his finger on the pulse of where to go and look for whooping cranes. This is a picture of 35 whooping cranes of a flock of 55 that we saw that day. We saw a total of 80 whooping cranes by the end of the day. And I've been following the whooping crane story for my entire birding career since I was 12. And, uh, and it, it was, it, it's overwhelming to see their numbers like this and to see their numbers coming back. Well, let's get away from the rare and the, and the intriguing and cool and, and interesting sightings and get to something like a duck. You know, we take these birds for granted. Well, I don't like mowing the lawn, so I built a pond in my backyard, and then I bring in water from the Bow River to fill that pond, and when I had the pond, suddenly I had a duck, and then the duck, was its nest was taken out by a skunk, so to make a long story short, I found the biologist that, uh, that invented the duck nesting tube, uh, who is a BC biologist, uh, and, and he first installed them in at your Delta Reserve there. When ducks, when mallards, when ground nesting ducks take over these duck nesting tubes, they have a 95% success rate of raising their chicks. When they're ground nesting, they have less than a 20% chance. So once I got the duck to nest in that tube, we had duck hatching after duck hatching year after year for five years and highly entertaining. Now, when the duck first started to nest in my backyard, I actually trained it to take food. I know you're not supposed to feed uh, you know, ducks, but I was feeding them only good food, only whole wheat. Uh, and, and, uh, but I trained it to take food. Well, when I, I built that, uh, that, uh, duck nesting tube, I had to invent a way to, uh, keep feeding it. So every morning, uh, here's the duck coming in every morning, the duck would leave the nest for an hour or so, I don't know, doing what girl ducks do when they leave the nest. But she would, she would, then she'd come back after about an hour and I would meet her there. I would be sitting there with my coffee. You can see her eggs inside the duck nesting tube and she'd come over and she'd get up on the dock. Now, when you build a duck nesting tube, they fly straight into the tube. But I built a dock for my duck because she's my duck and I'll do what I want. <laughs> anyway, there she is. I wanted her to be able to easily access, get in and out of her duck nesting tube. So here she is going in to sit on the eggs. And uh, and uh, and I would come down and join her every day for about the 30 days or so that it would take for her to get those youngsters off. And you can see my coffee cup there. And then I built a seven foot spoon out of a long piece of hardwood. And then I took a Dairy Queen spoon and I used duct tape get it and I attached that spoon then I would put in pre-softened pre-moistened high quality food into that spoon and I would feed her on the nest and uh, boy again you know it's like waking up in the morning and sitting on the throne and looking into the eyes of an owl when you can start your day feeding a duck in the morning like this you're gonna have a good day 
And, uh, and this duck rewarded me with her presence year after year for five years. She stopped returning two years ago. I think she went where ducks eventually go. Uh, and I've had other pairs of ducks in my backyard, but I have not been able to attract them yet into the duck nesting tube. I'm hoping that's going to happen. I'm like a farmer. I'm hoping it's going to happen next year. But there she is right there. What a pleasure. You know, and you know, people think of ducks as just background birds, but I would feed my duck before she started to sit on those eggs solidly when she was coming into the pond every day. I would put out that hopper. I couldn't wholesale feed her. Otherwise, I would just be feeding house sparrows and magpies. So I would only put the hopper out when she'd come up onto my deck. And one day I left the door open and she walked inside the house. Well, then the next day she brought her boyfriend inside the house. Now, remember, these are wild ducks. And I just thought it was profound that we had the, that kind of behavior. Well, we have a good number of common golden eyes. We see the odd barrel golden eye here, but we have a good number of common golden eyes. One, uh, during COVID, we had an exceptional number, it seemed, in the spring. And so, uh, and, and the males were dancing to the females and it looked like they were gonna try to find a place to nest. But of course, uh, nesting sites are rare. So I built one, a neighbor cut down a piece of maple, uh, a maple tree and I reshaped the one piece of log that had a bit of a natural hole in it. Lo and behold, within a week, I had my golden eye nesting down on my arbor right next to the river. And I would stick, I would hold my whole phone up. I'd stand on my tippy toes and hold the phone up and take pictures uh, at a much surprised duck in the nest, forever putting to rest why they call them golden eyes. But uh, what a pleasure. That first year, there's at least seven eggs there. Uh, and then the next year, it was the same. This is last year's, uh, this is, yeah, this is uh, two years ago, this photograph, this is last summer. Our, our duck. And uh, and we also had success with a Canada goose. I, I have, uh, and we all know, especially golfers know the importance of more Canada geese. So I had this Canada goose during COVID standing on my neighbor's tool shed, which is that cedar shaped shed right beside. And I thought if I built a platform there, maybe she would nest. And sure enough, she did right away. She had, she laid four eggs, three of them hatched that first year. The next uh, year, so this is right during the middle of COVID, she laid six seven eggs and six of them hatched. And I can view this nesting platform right from my morning constitutional location on the throne. So I was keeping track of what was going on every day. And here's a little video that I put together of that first year. When I noticed the chicks had hatched, I did this uh, wonderful shoot. This is right out of my bathroom window, looking down at these little tiny fluffy ducks. And then the moment came when ah, it left the nest. And that's a 10 foot drop to the ground. There it goes down. I put it in slow motion again and I could hear a thud down in the on the ground. There's mom who was watching from up above. It obviously freaked her right out, but she didn't have to worry because dad was already down there. He had already collected up the first two and then the third one, you're going to see it coming in from the right. And if you've noticed that male duck has a limp, it, I, I think it had a broken femur. So he's one of the heroes in this story. He stuck with the female and defended the nest throughout the whole sitting, t uh, the incubation time. Now the two adults and the three youngsters are gonna start walking down to the river. They have about a hundred, uh, well, maybe 35 meters to go to get to the river. In the background, if I had this audio turned up, you would hear a Merlin calling. So there's definitely dangers out there for little tiny fluffy things on the, on the ground. But as they walked, the adults stayed right beside them, of course. They ate grass all the way down. That would be the first green material these little guys would have ever tasted. And then down to the river, they had one more challenge. Fil filming this over the fence. Look at this. The youngsters are <laughs> tumbling down head over, head over heels. It's a good thing their bones are made out of rubber. Look at this. Again, I put it in in slow motion so you can see what a rough start it is for these geese uh, entering the world. But from there, of course, they join uh, mom who was in the river, dad was keeping a watch uh, from the rear end uh, there and uh, life progressed and we actually followed them through the summer uh, and dad stuck with them uh, with his gimpy leg all the way through the summer and what a pleasure to experience these types of little vignettes in nature and they are th there thick and thin. The snowstorms, the late spring snowstorms in Calgary can treat them pretty badly when they're sitting on the nest, but it seems to work. Now, I'm sure you know, or many of you know, that Calgary has an infestation of gray squirrels. That's, and a lot of people see them, uh, the black color phase, the melanistic phase of the gray squirrel. The gray squirrel is an Eastern species. 
they were re they were introduced into into Calgary uh, in the 1920s or 1930s. Uh, we have a population of red squirrels that you'll see pictured here, but the only good stable big population is found in Fish Creek further to the south or Edworthy Park further to the west. This guy must have been one of the young youngsters that was ousted from the territory and it was looking for new territory. And my theory is that the spruce trees are mature enough here in Inglewood that they can make a living because they're cone specialists, as you know. Well, here's the story of our red squirrel population boom in our backyard. Here they are. I just I just put my phone up on the fence and then let it run as the squirrel did a self-portrait. But you can see that she's got some teats there. I called her Henry at first because I thought she was a male and then I had to change it to Henrietta because she gave birth. And she gave birth in one of my flicker boxes and here she is standing on the top. And it just so happened I was in the backyard at the right time to capture the moment when she was moving her youngsters from one nesting box to the other. And as you know, red squirrels are cone collectors. I shot this up in the Yukon a couple of years ago uh, as, this, as, the, as they gather cones from the trees and they make middens, those piles of cones in the forest. And that's what they feed on all winter long. Of course, they don't hibernate. And, uh, and so our squirrel does the same thing. So when I, when I first saw the squirrel carrying something in its face, I thought it was a, a cone. And then I realized it was furry and moving. And so I quickly got my camera, I started to photograph and then I, Got some video of some amazing uh, uh, occurrences here. You can see mom is trying to shove the youngster into the nesting box. She's moved them from one nesting box to another. Uh, this I originally set this one up as a downy woodpecker box. The youngster she couldn't fit it in the hole, so she she went in the hole and she called the youngster. The youngster, you can see the eyes are still closed. It didn't quite know what to do. My wife ran in the house to get a pillow to put underneath the box because we thought the youngster was gonna splat onto the ground, but they're obviously adapted to this type of thing. Mom was calling incessantly inside. And you know what moms are like? She tried to get the kid in there by grabbing him by the face instead of letting the kid figure it out on his own. That, that didn't work. And then she tried to grab it by the arm and that didn't work. So she just went in and continued to call. And finally, like a little gymnast, the youngster climbed in safe and sound with his two other siblings. And this last summer, she gave birth to four, and uh, one of those youngsters is still uh, in our, our, our uh, yard, and, and sh this, this, uh, this squirrel is still around as well. We see her every day. And so with a little bit of luck, she'll survive another year and produce another bunch of youngsters. So very exciting population explosion. Now, during COVID, we also had a flicker, as we have every year nesting in one of my flicker boxes. And we finally decided, let's spend the money because we're not spending it on travel or gasoline. We may as well spend it on, on a, a flicker cam. So we put in a flicker cam. And this is the video, a flicker sky cam. I had it, it's about the size of a matchbox. I shoved, I mounted it inside the box. There's the flicker inside the box. She lands down after feeding the youngsters and then she picks up a fecal sack which is basically nature's ziploc fecal bag and you can see her flying out from the nesting structure there and so every day we would over lunchtime watch our flickers develop and because covid was kind of a depressing time my wife put a beautiful wreath on the front door and within a week or so we had some house finches or a house finch nesting on the wreath and she produced two little youngsters. I had to put up police tape to prevent the mailman from coming up and knocking or putting putting mail in our mail slot. Uh, and I put a, a box out on the driveway for our mail to collect. I didn't want to have them scared off the nest before they were ready to fledge. And that worked. And of course, exploring the, the parks south of the city, finding our first bluebird sightings of the spring is always such a joy. Getting to some of the locations like Frank Lake, uh, just south of Calgary, about 35 or 40K south of Calgary, uh, American avocets feeding on some of the insects, and then the close relative of the American avocet, the black uh, winged stilt, we came across doing a nuptial dance and a little bit of reading. And so this is where the sex part of the program starts and finishes. That's it. 
and walk off the stage like a couple of ballerinas. Absolutely amazing. Actually, we'll stay on that theme right here because uh, I, I was able to film some sharp-tailed grouse at a dancing lek in southern Alberta. The BBC picked up on that and they had us come back this last spring and last spring to work with the BBC film crew in filming this opportunity. And I'm going to show you part of this. I think my time is getting close. So, uh, but here they are, uh, sharp-tailed grouse at a lek in southern Alberta. And the, the joy of this was the background, which was the snow-covered mountains. And uh, so a stunning location. We would camp on the, the, the prairie uh, with, uh, in, in this case, it was the, uh, the day after the full moon. And that was our location from our camper. And then I cleaned the window as best I could to shoot through the glass of the, uh, of the gr grouse coming in and dancing. And if you have never seen a sharp-tailed grouse dancing lek, you must put that on your bucket list. Uh, Stan Shattuck in Outer Saskatoon, he runs a grouse lek watching program every spring. And uh, so there's a 100% way of, of getting uh, that experience uh, for you. Uh, amazing to watch. These birds apparently, we had 14 males and, um, and they will attract females in from quite a, 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 a large surrounding, maybe three or four kilometer radius around the dancing lek. The lek itself is maybe about uh, 10 meters across, maybe a little bit bigger, uh, where all the real active dancing occurs. And the strongest, most experienced male dances in the best part of the lek. And so it's really location, location, location for the breeding because he'll get about 80% of the matings. So 10% uh, of the males get 80% of the mating. So it's just like high school. <laughs> this is the avian equivalent. And, uh, and such intensity, such dynamics, watching the bickering and the fighting between the males. We never actually witnessed a copulation, although many times we saw females, which are actually quite difficult to distinguish from the males. The females would come in, the males would go crazy with dancing energy, and then somebody would run off with the female. And I think copulation happened in the bushes just beyond. We actually never witnessed, uh, even though we were there every day uh, last year for seven or eight days, and this year again. We, the BBC film crew came back again this year. It's going to be uh, uh, released. Uh, to the world next summer, so I'm very eager to see what they uh, what they produce. There's where the female came in, and you can see how the, the male birds have then run off. And the other males are left sort of to uh, lick their wounds, I guess, and wait for another opportunity for another female. But what an experience. Well, let's just finish off the show by first heading to northern Alberta, and then I'm going to bounce down to southern Alberta. This is uh, 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 Lesser Slave Lake. Uh, and it's it is a bird hotspot area. It 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 something called the Point Pelee effect occurs here because of the size of the lake and because of the 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 uh, rising land to the east. It funnels the birds in, and there's actually a bird observatory there every spring. Uh, there's a, a a crew of of biologists and and uh, ornithologists that work there banding birds, and it's quite exciting because the bird uh, volume and the population is incredible because of that point Peely effect. So American red start, a common sighting uh, of oven birds, which is a bird that I grew up uh, with uh, when I used to live out east. What a pleasure to see them in good numbers. Yellow-bellied sapsuckers, and the list went on and on. It was uh, really quite a, an exciting experience. I was in Point Peely last spring, and uh, the, the, the overwhelmed feeling of bird life was very similar. Down in southern Alberta, down in the Waterton area, this is a place that my wife and I have been exploring for a long, long time. Of course, they had the huge flyer, fire a few years ago, and you can see the burnt effects of that off in the background. But look at how the green has come back, and the population of bison has been reintroduced back into their paddock. So uh, it's quite exciting to go and visit there now. And with all the burnt trees, that's attracted in lots of woodpeckers. This is a downy, of course, but uh, uh, three-toed woodpeckers, hairy woodpeckers, and others are uh, yellow-bellied sapsuckers and so on, are not infrequently seen in the forest. And with all the light now that reaches all the way to the bottom of the forest floor, the green abundance is attracting and feeding all kinds of wildlife. The bird, uh, the, uh, the, the nitrogen uh, inoculation of the landscape has created this ridiculously beautiful landscape of flowers in the spring. And of course, it's some of the best bighorn sheep watching you'll have anywhere. Nearby, just to the north, 
of of Waterton. There's there's uh, all the new park area that was put aside by our previous government that who uh, believed in the development of parks, and uh, and we've been exploring systematically some of these areas uh, in in the front ranges, and uh, and this has been very exciting. Uh, the, during COVID, we used our our mountain bikes to go in about ten kilometers up a logging road, then we hiked up a pass. We were coming across purple grizzly bear poop all the way because of course of the uh, great berry crop that year. But we were hyper aware of the, the fact that we could run into a grizzly bear at the top of the pass, right on the border with British Columbia. That's, that's uh, that this is called Middle Kootenai Pass, and that's right on the border uh, with British Columbia. It's an undulating landscape, and so we came up over this one hill, and we saw a grizzly bear and a female with two youngsters. And she looked up at us as we were slowly backing off. She saw us backing off. We were going up into a treeless ridge, uh, um, open landscape, and so uh, she obviously was very nervous about our presence, but she uh, quickly got her two cubs, and they settled down and continued on on the way that they were going. So we didn't push them back the other way. We felt good about that. We waited until we saw them disappear um, onto the Alberta side, searching for berries before we continued. And, you know, with all the smoke that we've been having here, um, it's the, the, uh, the environment is a, it's a, it's a scary time. There's no doubt about it. And you can see it on this snow. We're at about a pass at about 3000 meters here in Banff. And you can see how, how much smoke there is in the air. You can see the soot that has landed on the snow. On the left-hand side, you'll see some droppings of some uh, mountain sheep or mountain goat. Actually, it would be goat in this area. Um, but it just, very difficult situation. And what we've had to do is shift our, our way of thinking into the smaller things, focusing on the red stemmed saxifrage, for instance. And we found some abundant fields of red, red stemmed saxifrage. And as we were enjoying that and photographing that, then we came across ptarmigan. And the ptarmigan were eating some of the fr uh, fleshy new leaves growing on some of the uh, small shrubs growing around the red stem saxifrage. And so appreciating the smaller things, I think, has been one of the lessons that we've learned over the last few years. Uh, and, and of course, with COVID, there was no tourism in Banff. Uh, we took advantage of that. We bicycled up the ski out at Sunshine, uh, to the Sunshine Meadows. We've been avoiding the Sunshine Meadows for years during the summer because it's usually, well, there's usually thousands of people up there, but we had the entire meadow for the entire day to ourselves. And as we were coming down, of course, the squeaks of the Colombian ground squirrels were nonstop. And then I saw what I thought was a pine marten ahead until I got close enough to realize that it was a Colombian ground squirrel, a melanistic Colombian ground squirrel. So I phoned up my now very, very, very good friend, the chief park ecologist, and I said, did you know that you had a melanistic ground squirrel up here? They did not. Uh, so I sent him a pin drop of the exact location. Uh, they kept track of it for two years before it disappeared. But uh, the the occurrence of melanistic coloration in Colombian ground squirrels is more rare than albinism, which is about one in five thousand. So uh, this is a, this was an extremely exciting sighting for me, and I call it once again a COVID gift. And I guess that's what the moral of this whole story is all about, you know, just just taking advantage of what's in our own backyard, getting out there, the larch colors. Uh, this is last fall uh, up in our Rocky Mountains, uh, the, you know, just such in beautiful environments and in our own Alberta backyard. I've been leading these trips, uh, these one day trips up to see polar bears in Churchill, which has been very exciting. But I guess at the end of the day, we do it because it's good fun and it makes us feel good. And some of you may recognize this is Nancy Barron, a longtime British Columbian uh, uh, bird uh, enthusiast. And we had camped in Kootenai National Park years and years ago. And here she is greeting us in the morning with a classic uh, feeling of joy, which is what it's all about when we get out there in nature. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is my presentation to you. Thanks so much for coming. Well, that's super. Thank you so much, Brian, for that uh, really interesting presentation. Uh, enthusiasm for nature really shows through there. Um, I guess we have time for questions. If uh, anybody wants to, you can either type something in the chat or unmute and ask your question. 
We have one little comment in the chat from Carolyn saying that uh, she was just at uh, Iguazu Falls in Argentina and spotted great dusky swifts on the side of a cliff. Oh, where two smaller waterfalls were converging. So that would also have been a nice sighting. Very nice. Yeah, Iguazu Falls are overwhelming. So do we have any other questions? I was looking at your downy woodpecker and wondering if it wasn't a hairy because the bill looked long to me, but uh, I'm sure you saw it much better than I did. So, uh, yeah, yeah, no, it was a, it was a, it was a downy. Yeah. At least that's what I identified it at at the oh, time. I'm sure you were right. <laughs> well, that was an amazing ray of wonderful wildlife activity across the world and particularly how you encouraged everybody to get out during COVID and see the local things, the little things, which is what, what I've done and uh, um, much appreciated. It, it really does up, uplift the spirits um, despite all the things that are going on in the world, Brian. So I really appreciate the, the honor of having you with us tonight and, uh, and, and sharing your, all of your positive activities with nature and wildlife. It's just been wonderful. So I really, really appreciate it on behalf of Nature Vancouver. So two thumbs up for you. Thank you. Well, thanks, Colin. No, it was a pleasure. So Naomi in the chat is wondering what measures were taken to protect the gorillas in COVID. Well, it was really quite something. When before we flew into Rwanda, we were in the Serengeti in the Maasai Mara. So we were in the in the Serengeti ecosystem on the Kenyan side. We actually had nurses fly in to administer the COVID tests. And then we flew by charter directly into Kigali. And by the time we got to Kigali, uh, we were given the clear to get off the airplane, but we were then taken by a private coach into a private uh, room at the airport to be given another COVID test. And uh, we were allowed then to get into our bus and drive to the hotel, but we weren't allowed to get out of the bus until we were given the all clear that none of us had COVID. Then once we got to uh, Kigali, and once when we were driving to the hotel in Kigali, one of the first things that uh, everybody noticed was that um, everybody in the streets of Kigali, they were all wearing masks. So it was it was very uh, it was very much embraced. And even in the little villages that we drove through, we saw hand washing stations. Then when we drove up to the uh, um, headquarters to get our guide to go in to see the gorillas, uh, they before they even allowed us to drive into the parking lot to get out of the vehicle, they wanted to see all of our, our credentials of our, of our uh, COVID vaccinations. Uh, then once we got into uh, the, the park, uh, or just before we actually entered into the park, before we actually walked through the gate that takes you right into the forest, we were issued standard uh, masks so that cloth masks weren't allowed. We had to use uh, medical masks. Uh, and then once we got to the gorillas, of course, we were kept uh, at a distance, which is what they always promote, but sometimes that's not easy to do. The, the risk of gorillas getting COVID is I think significant. Gorillas have, they can pick up pretty well all the same diseases we uh, can can get. All of the gorillas have been inoculated uh, for the mumps, for the measles, uh, and there's a dedicated uh, veterinarian team that watches the gorillas and to, just to make sure that if there's anything that goes wrong, they're in there very quickly, like a medical SWAT team to do an analysis. Uh, but having said all that, it's a risk. There's no doubt about it. However, the fact that the gorillas are still there, it can be purely, um, you know, looked at as a result of the tourism program and the, the park, which lost about 30% of its volume in the 1950s so that a pyrethrium could be planted as a, an insecticide. Uh, the bottom of the pyrethrium market fell out in the 60s when it was synthetically developed in laboratories in other parts of the world, but the gorillas had still lost 30% of their habitat. Now there's a dedicated effort to buy that habitat back from the farmers who've only been there since the 1950s, late 1950s, 1960s, um, to buy that back from them at fair market value and then employ those farmers into the tourism industry. And, uh, and some of the wealthiest people in the world are contributing to this. They're trying to grow the park to allow it to uh, come back to its original original size. So, and that's all a result of tourism. You know, tourism is a catch-22. I've seen 
I've seen negatives, but I've seen lots of positives from it. And um, yeah, I mean, it would be nice just to let the gorillas be on their own with nobody seeing them, but I think they would disappear. Oh, that's great. Um, another comment from me is that, uh, yeah, Michelle and I went to see the Whooping Cranes with Stan Shattuck uh, in oh, October good. this year, and it was really fabulous. I can heartily recommend Stan as a guide as well. Uh, he actually was my lab instructor when I took physics at the University of Saskatchewan back oh, in the 80s. <laughs> but uh, uh, but uh, going out with birding with him was really an amazing experience. Yeah, he is fantastic. And he runs just a pile of different birding programs. I'm on his mailing list now, obviously, and you are too, I'm sure. Mm -hmm. And it's it's amazing what he comes up with. And Saskatchewan is a lot of fun. It's a it's a great place. We went from we went from uh, um, Sand Hill or from uh, whooping crane watching to Sand Hill crane watching down at Outlook, Saskatchewan. Yep. Had a fabulous campsite overlooking the river and had uh, Sand Hill cranes coming in over top of our camper and landing down on the river until about two or three o'clock in the morning. And, uh, and of course the, the, uh, the snow geese were overwhelming. We went out to last mountain Lake as well, which was Canada's first bird sanctuary and, uh, spent some time there. I worked as a naturalist in Saskatchewan in my early twenties. And, uh, so it was fun to get back there and, uh, and re-explore some of those locations. So, um, no other questions in the chat. Did anybody want to unmute and ask a question? Is there anything else? Hey, thanks, Kirsten. That's my sister-in-law. <laughs> oh, excellent. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, I'm always amazed uh, just going to any little slough in Saskatchewan in the summer or fall and seeing, uh, or spring and seeing how many birds are there. It's, yeah. uh, it's quite something. And the prairies Here, really do have an amazing amount of life. Here's an interesting, interesting little uh, take on that. Uh, I was um, invited to a friend's uh, cabin, lakeside cabin, right up uh, near Prince Albert National Park. So we took a week to get there going through Southern Saskatchewan and camping. Uh, first night we camped beside uh, the South Saskatchewan, no, the uh, Red Deer River. And then the second night we camped beside the South Saskatchewan River. And uh, the third night we were at, at the North Saskatchewan River. But uh, for the first two nights between our first two mornings at the first two Riverside campsites, uh, I would turn on my Merlin app at 6 a.m. and sit there for 15 minutes. And each morning I had between 23 and 25 birds appear you know, including birds like the yellow-breasted chat, which I then ground truthed so that I was, I made sure that, that, that the, uh, that Merlin wasn't lying to me. So, and remember I was there in August. And so these are not their spring calls. These are communication calls. And yet Merlin is able to pick that up. And in one 15 minute location, 23, 24 species of birds, that's, that just gives you an idea of the abundance of these landscapes. Yeah, no, it's really amazing. But then again, too, the Christmas bird count that I took, I remember one year in Saskatchewan, I think we got seven species. <laughs> yep, I remember being in Saskatoon and hearing a report from the Christmas bird count. They were super excited they had found a robin. Yeah, bingo. <laughs> yep, that was great. Ryan, is there anything with this warm weather that's in greater abundance in Calgary, than in your area that you normally wouldn't? wouldn't see it this time of year because it would the cold would have driven it south or yeah yeah you know i think pretty, yeah, so many of these birds are are you know their their migration needs are controlled by day length so it, it what we're seeing really is winter species except you know with canada geese obviously and the open river uh, and there's good numbers of ducks still around we still have lots of mallards and i saw a golden eye today um and i saw a couple of mergansers here the, today so some of the water birds are still hanging around but uh yeah it's you know our 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 winter here the the the, the winter season definitely pushes a lot of themselves but i think what like i said our christmas bird count was over 60 species so you know, when you get enough people out there looking, they find stuff. Yeah. Well, that was wonderful. We shouldn't take up more of your time because you're already an hour ahead of us. So it's 9.41 your time. So thank you very much again. It was 
rather short notice, but we really, really appreciate your time and enthusiasm and the, uh, a wonderful selection of critters that uh, <laughs> most of us would never get to see in our lives. So thank you so much and uh, all the best to you and Dee and uh, hope it's a good new year for you. So thank you very much, Brian. Right. Well, all. thank you very much. And everybody uh, take care of your birds out there in, uh, in paradise.